pull up my ranking. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the sixth episode of Real Hawk Talk. In fact, it's not even Real Hawk Talk. I'm so used to saying that, but it is Hawk Blogger Mornings. I'm Brian M. Hauser. You can find me on Twitter at Hawk Blogger, and this is our first weekend episode. I don't know about you, but as a sports fan, at least in Seattle, maybe this is pretty consistent in other places as well. It's been frustrating over the years where you are eager to hear about the Seahawks. You're eager to hear about Seattle sports. You get to the weekends and there used to be some radio shows on the weekends. And then I'm guessing the ratings weren't good enough to get enough people to keep doing it. And it just goes cold. So your only option is to go in and find podcasts from earlier in the week. It's all a little bit older stuff. This is. This is fresh content, real live content to start your weekend on this Saturday morning, a little bit later than the normal 7.15 a.m. that I do the rest of the days, because gosh, we do need a little sleep on the weekends. And uh, we got a couple of guests today. Well, a co-host for me, Jeff Simmons, at Real Jeff Simmons, who everybody should know and love. And then we've got Griffin Sturgeon, uh, at C Mike Spin Move who everybody should already know, but if you don't, you will know him better after this show, who breaks down all sorts of film, all sorts of places, and has a podcast that he and Maddie Brown run as well. We'll get into some details there. Uh, let me welcome both of you. How are you guys doing this morning? Griff, how are you doing? Doing well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Doing well. Thank you. I've been a I've been a longtime listener and reader of Hawk Blogger content going back to high school. So this is, this is very cool coming on. My second appearance, though, I will say. Um, it is, it is, you've done shows with uh, Nathan, <laughs> correct? And I think Jeff yeah, maybe sometimes. Jeff. I don't know if I've yeah. ever done a show with you. I don't, I don't think so. This is our inaugural uh, appearance together. <laughs> that is right. That is right. So I, I appreciate that. And I take no offense in the implication of how old I am that you've been uh, reading and listening to Hawk Blogger since high school. I uh, actually have quite a few folks in that category, and, and actually it makes me smile every time. Jeff, how are you doing up there in uh, in Canada? I'm all right, man. I'm a little later in the day than you, but... That's right. Good. Uh, same thing here. We, we don't have a lot of good like radio content. Everything is Monday to Friday, so... It's good that like, podcasts get so like dated so quick. Like I was looking for something to listen to this morning, even, and like after all these pro days, like these podcasts become so dated after a day. It's crazy, especially at draft time. Yeah. It's true. It's true. Before we dive in, and there's so much to dive into, I want to first welcome a few new YouTube members, and we actually just got a third one. Uh, let's welcome Google Freeze to uh, our YouTube membership. Thank you, Google Freeze, for joining. I should not be shocked. Nobody should be shocked. Michael Mathis joins us as a YouTube member, one of our most generous patrons. He's also over there at patreon.com in the Slack channel. He's a super chatter. He is someone who really shows his appreciation for the work, and that means a ton to us. So, Michael, welcome to the YouTube side. And then... Just now, Rick R. has become a YouTube member. This is brand new, folks. So if you haven't heard about YouTube membership, we just launched it like a week or two ago. I have pinned the link in the chat that will allow you to join the YouTube channel as a member. And I think this should work on iOS. We were having some trouble before where the join button does not show up on iOS. So hopefully, if you can find it in the chat, that helps. Otherwise, Go to a desktop browser, look on, look for Real Hawk Talk as the YouTube channel, and you'll see a join button. And once you join, it will work on any platform, any phone, any browser. And what you get for being a YouTube member is essentially if you are looking to consume primarily that, this content on YouTube, you really want to do this. It puts a special little emblem on your name. So anytime you ask a question or put something in chat or anything like that, we will know that you're a member and that means we will prioritize responding and recognizing those comments. If you comment on a video later outside of a live show, we will notify, be notified about that. So it increases your engagement and our ability to engage with you. We also, for some of the higher levels, are going to do private AMAs, um, things like that, where we can talk Seahawks, talk other things and a great way to, to get to know folks as well. And also it's helping to pay for Jeff's microphone, which is going to be a uh, going to be shipped to him. He's arriving on Monday. We're very excited about that. That's a big unveiling. We should do an unboxing of that for, for Jeff. Uh, YouTube membership is new. Patreon membership is not, but it, Patreon membership is now getting extra value. So patreon.com slash hawk blogger. 
you go there and you get access to the Slack channel immediately where there's tons of conversations going on about Siak. A lot of draft information stays really up to date. And then also all the audio versions of this podcast are only available to Patreon members, okay? So other than our Wednesday show, which everybody gets, patreon.com slash hawkblogger is where you get the audio versions of this show and all the other Hawkblogger mornings, all the other emergency podcasts, all the other mock draft madness. Those are only for patreon.com slash Hawkblogger members. So please go there and support the show. If you want this content to continue as often and as frequently as we're doing it, uh, we definitely want to grow membership um, to make it worthwhile to, to keep up this level of content creation. So, and there, hey, Langston Eagle, welcome a new member. Corey Lee, welcome a new member. Fantastic memberships growing and that's just going to make it all the more valuable. All right. Now let's get into it. Griff, uh, I, I'm i calling you Griff because everybody else calls you Griff, even like I, I've never met you before, but I'm going to just call you Griff like uh, we're old friends. Hope that's yes, okay. Totally, totally, by all means. Can I ask you how you got started in breaking down film? Like, is this, did you play football? Did you have a history knowing the game? Or did this just become something that you grew into uh, over time? Um, growing up, I mean, I played basketball and baseball. So football, I, I wasn't allowed to play football. I, I had no personal experience with it. Um, but like many people, I was a fan of the sport, right? So, um, and I enjoyed consuming content. So uh, like, like I, I mentioned earlier, reading your blog, reading field goals, um, I was just attracted to, you know, smart people talking about the details of the game. And, and, and like with any hobby, you realize, you know, if you really enjoy it, you just want to consume more and more, right? So um, there were a couple of articles um, talking about like the Seahawks like fronts and stuff from 2013 and I was just like that's awesome I know what an over front is now I know what an under front is now but I remember thinking like but but why an over front but why an under front um I, like I knew what cover three was at that point but like why cover three you know um so kind of questions like that um and o over time just as you as you read more eventually you come across a, a, a clinic that is online for free Nick Saban talking about cover three have no idea what the hell he's talking about, but but you realize it's like oh, there's a lot more to this than I could have fathomed. You start googling some of the terms, and you know over time you just start piecing together information. And as it turns out, there's a really cool online community that likes to talk about football, um, reaching people that had played that didn't play, coaches, um, and and you just start. It's like like with anything, it's it's like skill building really. Um, and of course you, and then you want to apply what you've learned, you get a lot wrong. And then you realize you go back and read a tweet that you posted two years ago, breaking down something. And I had no idea what I was talking about. And I thought I did. Uh, but like, that's cool though, because it's, you've realized that, Hey, there, there's more to learn. Um, it just brings a, a different perspective on the game. At the same time, you can also get lost in the details and you start to lose perspective. So it's like, you kind of have to come full circle. Like what's, what's the macro, what's the micro. Um, but yeah, like I really, it's just, I'm just regurgitating what much smarter people have taught me, um, you know, implicitly and explicitly. Um, but yeah, so there are a lot of resources online and I encourage anyone, like if you ever hear a football term that just seems like inaccessible, you can literally just Google it or even term search it on Twitter. And eventually over time, you'll, if you expose yourself to it enough, you'll, you'll assimilate that information and um like know what they're saying um i i you know for me it was like over the course of many years but um yeah it's 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 been a fun journey learning football for sure i'm curious where you get the film for evaluating players so i know the all 22 mm -hmm. film that you can get from nfl subscriptions for nfl games and that kind of stuff what about for college games? Do you do any high school, um, high school breakdowns, but at least for college, like you like the rest of us where you just have to search on YouTube for, for, you know, broadcast or where, where do you get your film? Uh, for, for college, there's a little bit of a, um, an underground market. You could say um, it, it's, it's as the most recent years, it's been, it's the catalog is shrinking the library. I'm not sure why, so I'm having to like piecemeal it together through various people. And then you have to 
You have to trade with guys. Hey, do you have Michigan 22 defense? I'll trade you Wyoming off, you know, stuff like that. Really? Yeah, you you really have to demean. You have to go low, demean yourself to to get to get what you want. Um, but no, but like uh, people are really you know friendly and they, they they like to help and stuff. And there's some mutualism going on online. But yeah, it's hard to get. Like th- this year, it's been really tough. Like I I can't find Texas defense. Like I have three games, and mm-hmm. you'd think like you know one of the top five teams in the country with all these prospects that they would be at the same time. Maybe that's why it's harder to come by. Um, but it's like, I'm able to get all of UW offense, for example. So, you know, I know what Grubb and Pettix are thinking, but it's like, I can't get, can't get Alabama defense even. It's just, well, I have Alabama defense. There's, I think Georgia defense. So it's, um, it's a little frustrating this year. It used to be more ubiquitous previously, but yeah, it's it's really just DMing people. It's DMing people and asking, and then you get added to a group and yeah. That's wild. That is not what I would have expected. And, and I'm kind of picturing some some guy with a trench coat and VHS tapes on the corner, you know, hawking Texas 89 <laughs> for, you know, whatever. That's that's fascinating. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's obviously it's valuable enough that do, do you feel like you can make your assessments of players or schemes without all 22 if you're just watching broadcast do you feel like you can get enough or are there certain things that you just know like coverages maybe are just almost too hard to get that way but you know maybe you can feel good about offensive line or defensive line film kind of curious how that works for you yeah with with the line of scrimmage because before i got hold of tape i was relying on like youtube cutouts and stuff so with line of scrimmage the the it's you can separate guys by round pretty easily not having the the end zone angle is for where you really want to split hairs like before i got taped this year watching byron murphy and johnny newton i i mean i could kind of have an idea but just using those two as an example like for the most part i'm like i can't really tell who's better than who without the end zone angle because i can't see what their feet are doing like precisely where their hands are going what they're reading like what like what their keys are and stuff and I, I'm probably getting that stuff wrong anyway, because it can differ team to team. But so like, but like I can tell apart, in my opinion, anyway, like I can tell apart Byron Murphy from Michael Hall, for example, off the broadcast. But it's getting to the tape where like I need the tape to be able to differentiate between Murphy and Newton, for example, or like, you know, BB and say Christian Haynes on the other side of the ball. Whereas off broadcast, it's like, yeah, you can certainly get, you can even make an opinion if you want, but if you want to feel more thorough, you'd prefer the tape. Now getting to the second level with like the safeties and the corners, I mean, it's, it's nearly impossible. It's just, you just mm-hmm. literally can't see them. Uh, yeah. With the linebackers, you certainly get a feel for like, you can tell their traits right away. Like, are they fast? Can they hit? What's their change of direction? Even like if they're carrying a seam, like you, you, if you, even though they're running off screen, if depending on like how they're relating to the route before they run off screen, like, you know, you know, when a linebacker gives it up, uh, gives up a route downfield, if they have a matching assignment, like a one-on-one assignment, you can sometimes tell based off of what the broadcast does show. He's like, okay, I bet you if I had the tape, that was a good rep. Sometimes though you go hunt for that exact, that exact snap on the all 22. Once you get a hold of it, and then they lose, you know, they they lose the guy by three yards or something, and maybe they get lucky they don't get targeted. But you wouldn't know because uh, you literally can't see it half the time. But safeties, it's really tough. Corners, you can get a feel for their line of scrimmage play, which is a huge part of the equation. But yeah, to a certain extent, it's like you're you're really squinting. And I had to make some of my uh, evals on the linebackers based off broadcast. I wasn't able to get tape on all of them, so I feel a little incomplete about it. But you you can still kind of get a get a general sense for it. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in here, uh, Griff. Yeah, it's great talking yeah. to you. You're one of my. You might not always agree with me, but you're one of my favorite Twitter accounts out there. I think constant <laughs> content, the engagement. Like I'm always looking for people to talk in Seahawks, and I love your I love your account. So uh, I That's see what sure. you're. Appreciate yeah, I that. see what you're talking about most of the time. So curious on this. You are one of the biggest kind of Pete Carroll advocates based on a lot of the narratives that had been going around. Some of those narratives were certainly coming from some guys on our show that are not here today. Um, <laughs> so Mike McDonald, Ryan Grubb, like 
where are you on the state of the team? I know you guys have talked about like over the last two years, the front office and the coaching staff have not aligned in personnel. Like where is your head at in terms of, I know we'll get into some of the decisions they made a little bit. I know there's one big one, but where are you at right now with like the state of the team and the coaching yeah. changes? Like where's your head at right now? Yeah. Well, my short answer is that I'm generally very positive um, with, with regarding to firing Carol or however that really went down. My mind was, they overachieved in 2022. Even Schneider said so. They overachieved in 2022, underachieved in 2023. Um, my mind was thinking, you know, just give him a third year into this reset and then assess. This felt to me like it was just a year too early to make a decision. Um, I, I myself, I was like, all right, Pete needs to he needs to be able to show that he can get the defense to a a consistent level of competence. There's just so much up and down, up and down, which is really frustrating. And we all try to nitpick why and stuff. But I was I generally went into the offseason thinking, well, there's no way they're going to fire him. They're, they're going to give him another year. And I was blindsided by that. I did not think that I was totally wrong. Um, I, I still would have, you know, if I could have gone back in time and made a decision, say if I was in charge, I would have kept Pete. Just I thought it just warranted one more year. I thought 2022 banked enough goodwill. Uh, for if we remember the expectations, like they're going to be uh, one of the five worst teams in the NFL, and they they went to the wild card, you know. Um, but so, and I also just saw so much potential with like kind of the new nucleus he had formed, and I wanted to see him see that through. But anyway, if you're going to fire Pete, the best hire you could have made is Mike McDonald, in my opinion. So I liked some of the other names, like Ben Johnson would have been cool. I would have been all right, Ben Johnson and Gino. Let's go see what happens, right? Um, but. Mike McDonald is, I think, the best hire they could have made and, and everything that he's exhibited to us through his interviews, which, you know, you can only parse so much, right? Uh, I'm pretty enthusiastic about it. So um, as far as disconnect between team and front office, th that was more so like the final two years. It seemed like, sh and we know Pete was technically in charge, right? But, I mean, he's delegating. He can't literally – he can't do the job of both the GM and the head coach. Like, it's impossible. That's why you hire a GM. But uh, it felt like Schneider was rostering as though the scheme was remaining static. He was rostering to in response to the previous season of how the, the personnel and scheme didn't match up. And then the coaches were changing the scheme or tweaking the scheme as though to match the previous season's personnel. So it felt like they were chasing their tail – um it, it's it's uh like w when they had that that 2021 group uh or the 2022 group they had in my opinion three four personnel but they just didn't play very much three four in spite of kind of saying we're switching to three four it's true in that um that their base front was a three four but they played so much two four five nickel which functions like a four three um and and so I'm thinking like, well, just simply play what you're good at. And then the following year, they get rid of all those players. Oh, because they're not three forfeits. And then they, sorry, my dog is, has opinions. Um, yeah. uh, I might need to let him in. Anyway, so it just seemed, it's just seemed like they weren't on the same page. Now, of course, like, I know that sounds such an odd thing to say, because surely Pete and John have these conversations, like they know what they need. So I'm only parsing that as an outsider and, you know, fan with my armchair analysis, but it definitely seemed like something was off. Um, as for how Mike and, and John work together, I mean, that remains to be seen, right? They made some decisions. Um, they kind of have a, an MO that is, I'm trying to wrap my head around a little bit. I know we'll talk about that, but the roster building is, is I get some of it. Some of it I don't quite get. I don't know like what they're, what they're signaling to the audience, so to speak with it. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Basically it's just kind of touch and go like, see, see what happens. I'm going to let my dog in really quick. Yeah, go so ahead. Go ahead, Griff. Let your, let your dog in. So it's interesting, Jeff, uh, you know, I want to get back when Griff gets back and talk to him about what he sees in scheme differences. And then we'll talk about some of the prospect rankings he's got and, and how he feels about some of the offseason pieces. You know, one of the things you and I both have, have recognized with Griff uh, is that he's I don't think he's loved this offseason very much. It's been a rough offseason for him and for you know, the, the guys that, that he likes and the coaches he likes. So, uh, Griff, we were just talking about that, that, that yeah. this seems like this has been a bit of a, a rough off season for you. You know, it, like, I don't yeah. know that I've seen you get other than maybe the Mike McDonald hiring. I don't know how you feel about Ryan Grubb, but 
and Huff, but it feels like got coaches you like were not brought back, players you like were not brought back, and you don't particularly love <laughs> the guys that have been added. Is is that a fair characterization? Um, it's I, I I'm probably more negative than most. But that's only like relative. Like generally, like I'm still very optimistic. I've just been you know freaking out over minor decisions really um or like pieces here and there but it doesn't affect my like overall perspective um i, I like grove a lot i just didn't like if you're gonna fire pete you're really getting rid of the whole staff so like i knew we were saying goodbye to waldron for example and i'm not like this i wasn't this like guy who swears by waldron like like i was with shoddy i just thought he was a good oc and i didn't think that like if you're if you're being very like ones and zeros performance review, I don't think he, anything he did warranted being fired. Um, so, but again, if you're getting rid of Carol and you're bringing in a new guy, let him hire his own guy. Right. So I get that. Um, like I thought it was cool. He brought back Carl Scott, um, Clint hurt. I, I wanted them to move on from him under the assumption they were keeping Carol. So I thought, Pete, you got to move on from Clint hurt. I actually thought hurt had some cool ideas he just couldn't put it together. Like my criticisms of Hurt is not like play calling or scheme per se. It was clearly something was going wrong subjective with like the lines of communication with his players, like not connecting with them the right way, not motivating them the right way. Um, whereas in contrast to his predecessor, Ken Norton Jr., who I also like more than most, I thought Ken was very good at getting his players on the right track. And he was very good at scheming in response to roster problems but he wasn't good at scheming from a point of strength. I thought mm -hmm. Hurt was good at scheming from a point of strength, was very bad at solving problems. And it was like, I really wanted Pete to just take over and be like, combine the two because they do overlap still, combine the two and be the, the meddler that some people think that you are. And, you know, he would step in in the middle of the season, there would be a little boost, and then it would kind of fall apart. I don't know if he stepped back or not. I actually did get some interesting intel from my cohort, Matty Brown. He spoke to him in Munich. And if we remember the middle of 2022, when they kind of like got like for a month, played really good football, and then they kind of played average defense. So Pete told Matty that he literally told Clint and Sean Desai, like, no, we're doing X, Y, and Z. And so you can see it. You can measure it on tape. Like they did X, Y, and Z. They played more of this, less of that. The results followed. So my mind was like, Pete, you need to be one of those head coaches, one of those defensive head coaches that is effectively the actual DC, the way that Mike Zimmer is, the way that Rex Ryan is. He just refused. He's just the CEO type of head coach. And if we're going to criticize him, like he failed technically within that, that, that style of being a CEO head coach, right? I mean, we saw what happened to his defense. He, he, he kind of forced Clint Hurt to kind of combine Fangio with more like money Kiffin principles. And it worked for about eight or nine games. And then the dam broke and it kind of showed how flimsy it was. And it showed some of the kind of the weaknesses of the roster and also the weaknesses of the coaching staff. But um, it's, I really wish Pete just was more hands-on toward the end. And he just kind of refused to be um, not that it would have worked had he been, but um Sorry, I forgot the question. Um, no, no, like that, that's great. And, yeah. and I actually, if, it, if it's okay, just to jump in there, uh, this is this is probably a little bit of a, a tangent for some folks, but I always end up, <laughs> some of these things relate for me to the work I've done in my career. And and so I, I was in product management for a long time, been doing that for a long time and, and you know, done it as a frontline product manager who's responsible for the direction of the product, the overall strategy, all those things. And you're making those decisions combined with your engineering and design partners and all that kind of stuff. And it's great. And then I've been in a situation where I've managed product managers or groups of, you know, managed managers of product managers or directors of groups, you know, whatever, like lots of layers. Mm -hmm. And what starts to happen is I've always uh, analogized it to writing a book. And mm -hmm. if you're building a product for a customer and you are the sole author, there's a cohesion to the story. You know mm -hmm. the characters, you know how you're going to end one chapter, start the next chapter, you know how you're going to stack the story together. It becomes harder when you have to tell that story through others and you have different people writing different chapters responsible for different characters. And I that's kind of what it reminds me of as you're mm -hmm. talking about Pete is I, I even experienced that as I got, you know, more and more removed from the day to day that I 
really wanted these folks to be, they had to stand on their own. I knew if I did that for them, that wouldn't scale. I couldn't do that and all the other things I had to do and other people needed them to do their jobs well. So you get in this bit of a pickle where, mm -hmm. okay, I could go in and I know I could do that job and I could probably do it better than them. Yeah. But that's not my job. And if I do that, there's other things I'm not doing that I've got to do. And and, and then there's a little bit of something, this is a personal thing where you kind of like, you lose the taste for doing the day to day. You want to do the, some of these other things. That's why you're, you've moved your career in that direction. So I wonder if some of that comes into to play with someone like Pete and, you know, I, I will always hold Pete in high esteem. I will, you know, he's, he will always be one of my favorite people and coaches and parts of the Seahawks lore for sure. So we're not going to turn this into a Pete retrospective, but it was interesting to hear yeah. that. The question I had for you next, before we get into specific players and prospects, and there's a, mm -hmm. a reason for this kind of progression is with Grubb and with McDonald, I don't want to go into the level of detail that you and Maddie go into, but give me, give us a couple obvious differences that we're going to see. Yeah. Let's start with the defense. Sure. Our linebackers going to be used the exact same way. Is this, you know, should we expect, I've been noticing Mike McDonald on the roster for Baltimore and in Michigan, he tends to have heavier defensive tackles. He, he doesn't mind a 350 pound or a 340 pound nose tackle where Pete almost never had those kinds of guys around um, heavier defensive ends. Are, are there things that you're seeing in how, Mike McDonald schemes up a defense that would be noticeably different for a Seahawks fan that, that could then impact the types of players that they're going to want to add. Um, sure. Going forward. Um, so, sorry, I'm going to pause really quick. My dog just started gnawing on a bone. <laughs> I think my mic's picking it up. So I'm going to call. That's okay. That. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, Jeff, what are your thoughts? Um, I think the one thing that McDonald did last year, I'm not as, I haven't watched like, the Michigan 2020 film, uh, probably like Griff and Maddie have. But the, the way pressures last year were something that was really unique in the NFL. And the, the way he was able to like, maximize Clowney and Van Noy, and obviously the coverage linebacker responsibilities are going to look a little different, but like those simulated pressures off the edge, the way they just – and I think what McDonald talked about the other day is like everyone has to be able to blitz. And that was really interesting to hear him say that exact – the way they – when you watch Baltimore, how they just couldn't dictate where the pressure was coming and the way they would use Clowney and kind of, to, I don't know if they have those personnel yet. They're still figuring out who their long-term linebackers are, but that just looked really, really different compared to almost any other defense in the league. So Griff, mm -hmm. restating, uh, first starting with, with, with defense, clear, clear changes, like one or yeah. two, maybe three uh, tops yeah. that you see that, that are important to understand. I think the main thing, like the number one thing in my mind that sticks out, just like a thousand foot view or 10,000 foot view, um, and really it distinct how it McDonald distinguishes himself from Carroll, but then like really the whole league is that he really leans into disguising the coverage uh, post snap. So, I mean, there are a lot of moving parts. It's, it's very much kind of like wink martindale rex ryan-esque in terms of how much stuff he's willing to change pre-snap to post-snap um it's it's like i think he was like 30 percent of the time he's changing the look from or at least changing the safety shell um so if there's one high show he, he goes into two eye if he's showing two eye goes into one eye if he's showing no high so like a cover zero blitz look he'll spin into something else so as far as what the actual coverages that he runs, like the actual coverages themselves of what he's rotating or disguising into is going to look fairly familiar. It's how he gets there and how he layers and sequences that. Like it's very precise and everything. He has really clear ideas of how he's trying to either attack the scheme or, or attack a specific quarterback. With his game planning, I noticed like with when he, when he played the 49ers, for example, structurally, he was getting kind of beat by Shanahan, but as I kept watching, because we five turnovers, they bottled them up. One of the best games of the season, right against the 49ers. He wasn't trying to break Shanahan. He was trying to break Purdy and mm. he succeeded He's when there's chaos, we're going to take advantage of it because Purdy will put the ball in harm's way. They got to capitalize it really like 
they yielded some stuff to Shanahan. Like they almost it seemed like they didn't put effort into trying to stop some of those inbreakers. And I just found that interesting. Now with him in his own division, I think he's going to adapt a little, some of his like fundamental structure to to accommodate for Shanahan because Shanahan and McVay are, are different from the the spread it out AFC teams um, like Cincinnati and, and Kansas City and Buffalo, right? Um, but so disguise is the main thing. And then his other calling card is how he attacks protections. And, but this, I would argue though, that he and what the Seahawks said last year was actually pretty similar. So like Jeff, you mentioned those sim pressures, right? I think they, they ran sim pressures at like the first or second most in the league Baltimore did, but Seattle surprisingly was like fifth. They ran quite a few of them. And so did, so did Vic Fangio. And so th there, there's a section of their playbooks where they actually intersect a little bit. And Seattle just happened to live in that area a little bit more um, than McDonald did. But where I think they differ within that, and also I would say, if we're going to isolate something that Seattle did do well statistically, when they rushed five, so not quite a blitz where they're rushing six, but where they're sending like a zone pressure or man pressure, where they're rushing five guys, or where they are doing a sim pressure where you're blitzing a second level defender, but you're dropping a defensive lineman. So there's still only four guys rushing. If you're going to isolate something to Seattle that did something well, their numbers when sim pressuring or, or when rushing five were actually quite good in terms of yards per cover snap and then the pressure rate, the sack rate. What's different though is that Seattle would do it stemming off of a static look. So, like, here's our what we normally do. Okay. We're actually sending this guy and dropping that guy. Whereas McDonald, he's doing it off of, we're going to blitz six. We're going to blitz seven. And we're actually only going to rush four. So he's he's coming at it from a super aggressive frame of reference and then being more conservative post-snap. But he's giving the idea of the illusion of aggressiveness. Whereas Seattle is giving the, the illusion of conservativeness, conservatism, the illusion of like, I'm just a flounder in the bottom of the ocean. And then, okay, now we're going to attack you with, you know, a dagger to the chest. So they're, they're both using a lot of sim pressures, but come kind of from like a different, like philosophical, like background almost. And really like, if we think about Wink Martindale blitzing six, seven guys, Rex Ryan blitzing, McDonald is kind of like the rush for flavor of that tree. And so it's um, it's I think a little bit more economical. He's leaning into the idea of I want seven bodies in coverage. I want guys to play their rules, to be disciplined, to everyone to be in cohesion. If everyone has a good zone drop and the corners are playing good technique and the safeties are playing their primary threat and they have the range to play their secondary threat, we're going to choke the ball out. The quarterback's going to freak out. I'm going to get a free rusher from from my design sim pressure, and and we're so he's kind of combining soundness and aggression um, in terms of attacking protection. And when you have the guys, I mean, it's, it's really hard. It's, it's really hard to, uh, to be. Um, yeah. I, I have other this thoughts. Is, you're you're putting a stuff. smile on, on everyone's face right now. Breaking Purdy, starting with that. I, I you really like very eloquently described what I think we all watched with Mike McDonald's defense is it somehow managed to be incredibly aggressive and uh, assertive while also covering all the bases. And it managed yeah. to do that throughout a game. It wasn't like it would have these periods. It was able to do that across different defenses, across different offenses, different OCs, different quarterbacks. So uh, really well described. Does that mean then that the, there's different defensive linemen that they are looking for, different linebackers that they're looking for. Anything quickly there before yeah. we move on to the offensive side? You know, I think at linebacker, um, at least, I mean, like he's not looking for for Bobby, like 33-year-old Bobby Wagner again, who, which, love Bobby, one of the best of all time, one of the best cover linebackers of all time in his prime, right, which wasn't that long ago. Um, but I, I think he's kind of just looking for complete linebackers. They have to be able to fit the run. They have to be able to blitz, but they have to be able to cover. They have to know, like, they have to know where the routes are. They have to be able to put the picture together um, just based off little morsels of information to to inform themselves, like, where do I spot drop to? How do I tailor my drop? I have to be able to turn and run with the seam route. Um, so I think he's kind of looking really, not for anything super unique at linebacker. He's looking for, like, everything – that you would think of when you think of a really good, well-rounded linebacker. I really don't think anything novel there. 
like Roquan Smith was a do-it-all linebacker when he came out, right? So um, uh, like Jordan Brooks, for example, who I'm aware of, like I like more than than, than most do, but I, I know I know pe- people appreciate him. So I'm not trying to straw man there. Um, for for example, though, like Miami run, runs the same scheme and they signed him to play Mike for them. So like I thought he would have been exactly what Mike was looking for, Mike McDonald. And who knows, maybe he was. We have no idea what happened with the contract negotiation there. Like it, it happened so quickly. Um, if I was Jordan, I would have waited to see what Aziz Al Shair signed for. I don't I have no idea how he signed a bigger deal than almost everyone except Patrick Queen. That shocked me. But um me too, um, for what it's worth. Yeah, yeah. A- anyway, but uh, so at linebacker, I think it's kind of status quo. I think Schneider is going to keep drafting the way he normally does at linebacker because I think they're kind of in lockstep there. Um, uh, at, at D-line, though, there, there might – I mean, like, yeah, Seattle didn't have – Seattle didn't have a Michael Pierce on the roster this year, but they did have Al Woods previously, right? I mean, he was 340. He could play zero technique, one technique. He could two gap, one gap. Um, they they ran a base 3-4, right? But it was the type of 3-4 where you're basically running an under front with five guys up on the line of scrimmage. And if you think back to Seattle's classic 4-3 under, 4-3 over with – Clemens at Leo and Red Bryant at Big End, whatever. If you take that front, like Bruce Irvin, the Sam is on the line of scrimmage, right? If you take that front, that picture from the end zone angle and simply stand Chris Clemens up, you are running just about exactly what Mike McDonald runs, which is also toward the end of the season, exactly what Seattle was running. So there's really a lot more similarities than differences. As far as individual body types, I think that's more like one-on-one coaching preferences. So yeah, He's probably like they signed Hankins, right? He probably doesn't want Jaron Reed being the only true nose on the roster. He's going to want a guy that can play a little bit of like two eye on the guard where you're kind of playing a two gap technique. Um, when they go into their four down stuff, so their nickel, their four, two, five, and they only have four guys on the line of scrimmage. And there you pair that with a two high shell, so a light box, you it puts more stress on each individual alignment. So I do think the edges are going to have to be bigger. Uchenna Nwosu, for example, is a great example of a guy who plays above his weight. So, like, he's 255, but he plays like he's 265. Daryl Taylor is a guy who is probably 245, who plays like he's 245, for example. Um, And then Clowney is, I think Clowney is, like, at this point, 260 max, but he plays like he's 270 against the run, right? So he's going to want guys that play above their weight. Um and you know but but mafe i think you know he's a solid 260 255 i think you can kind of give that but they might be going after edges that are more even though they're a three four they play so much four down nickel that they're they might be going after kind of classic four three type of ends edges that can um that are balanced against the run in the past on the on the interior i mean they have so many guys on the interior like leonard williams fits any scheme right um, Jeremiah Jones is a little bit of a tweener, but you can find a role for him. Um, but yeah, I, mean, I think we can use Baltimore as a good frame of reference. Just looking at those body types, he probably does want a little more beef on average. Uh, but I don't think Seattle historically is against that either. It's just more so how the roster shook out the last year or two. Um, so I think Schneider and McDonald are, are more or less after the same body types at D-line. All right, I gotta ask this, and then we're gonna get we're gonna get into the prospects. And Jeff is gonna have a lot more on the draft side as well that I know he's got questions about and thoughts about. So we talked about defense for for a sec. Give me a beat on Ryan Grubb, um, uh, Mike McDonald this week. Basically implied it's a completely different offense than what they've been running. Yeah. It's coming from a different place, and that's obviously piques my interest do you have you know a couple differences that you'd want to call out about where grubs approach would would be noticeably different than something that, that the seahawks have been running with with shane waldron yeah I, with waldron the the spine of that offense is all about the outside zone wide zone run game from under center or pistol and then you've got all the play action attempts off of it right when you go into gun it's more more spread um which ironically is where he and Grubb overlap a little bit, but, but yeah, like, excuse me, Grubb's like meat and potatoes. 
he he's he lives in a spread world he um he'll he'll introduce some blockers into the blocking scheme like extra blockers from tight end or motion um but it's more so like i mean we saw it with Penix, right like Penix rarely turned his back to the defense even out of like when they call their their deep pocket play action it was more so still from from shotgun there's a little bit of pistol um but that, that's also kind of like the college game so he just is more like like full-time spread whereas waldron was a little bit more balanced because he comes from that that outside that under center outside zone world we saw Walter become a little bit more spread than McVay and Shanahan. I think that's because he had DK Metcalf and you want to keep D DK Metcalf in a wide split as often as possible, which then kind of changes the concepts you can run. So I think with Grubb, it's, um, I mean, I don't know how he, adapt it's not even adapting to the Seahawks. It's about adapting to the NFL. A lot of his like actual play calls are perfect for, for, the, for the NFL. It's more so um, like what he'll need to, not what he'll need to throw out, but what he'll need to add. I think to just kind of stick, stay with the um, just the realities of, of like the NFL being different from college, you know, different hash marks. You can't go as deep as often because when you've got Penix and Odunze and Polk and everyone, you can go deep at the rate they did. I just don't think it's sustainable, even with Seattle's personnel. I mean, Gino's one of the best deep ball throwers himself, right? Statistically, you've got DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett. You still can't go as deep with them in the NFL as Penix did in college, just because it's, it's the there aren't as much there isn't as much talent disparity, you know. You you dub playing, you know, Wazoo this past year is, is is different than Seattle even playing the Cardinals, for example. There's just the the talent gap is wider in college. Um, so, um, well, uh, I am curious to see like if he rallies around like kind of a meat and potato run scheme, or if it's more pass to set up the run. I don't even mean in terms of like pass rate or run rate. Um, but formationally, what does he live in? So I am curious to see that. Uh, I do think that we'll see a lot of pistol. We saw a lot, a lot of pistol in 2022 with Gino and Waldron, and then they kind of left it a little bit this past year. Um, I, I wonder if, if Grubb sees that as the, like the marriage between what he did in college and what he feels like he needs to do in the NFL. But bottom line, I'm really excited. I mean, he's got, He's got the Odunze analog and DK. He's got the Polk analog and Tyler. He's got the McMillan analog and JSN. They pay their fourth target $10 million. So, I mean, if they can find a guard, they're going to be throwing it all over the place. Um, they might even be throwing more than they did the past two seasons, and Seattle's had a high pass rate. So uh, I'm very I'm very eager to see what they do. I think Grubb is really good at um, at game planning, too. Like His, his offense is sound. But then I think he's really good at game planning it about finding those one on one matchups. So I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty excited about the whole thing. Initially, I was a little hesitant because while I like Penix a lot, I couldn't I I wasn't sure the elements of the UW offense that I wasn't sure translated to the NFL. I didn't know if it was quarterback sourced or or like OC sourced. And as I watched more and I watched some of Hayner at Fresno State, um, I think it was a little bit more quarterback based and that's not a knock on Penix. It's just more of a style thing. And I think Penix will adapt a little bit to the NFL too, um, especially if he go goes to the right team, which I hope he does for his sake. Um, um, yeah, but all in all, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited. The more I watched of Grubb, I'll say the more excited I was. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's good to hear. And I, I know uh, we're, we're excited. Jeff, what do you say we introduce Griff to our mock draft? Uh, fun and that that as a way to kind of talk through prospects along the way does that sound good it, it's it's a dry, exactly what we're transitioning for the reason we're been nerding out of these shows is we're a month out from the draft it's we, me and brian have been doing like an absurd amount of mock drafts so I, before we get started i want i've been asking a lot of people this question grip I, I put this out on twitter the other day i don't know if you're a trade down guy i don't know if you're a stick and pick guy as of now 16 or what trade down who's the one guy you're hoping ends up a seahawk in the first round so my my heart says against my better my better judgment i really want johnny newton on this team um and i don't even think i don't even think mcdonald sees him as a fit from a height and length perspective i think he might view the even be the same with byron murphy I, he they they might have knocked them off their board in terms of like have to get not off their board but like 
if you're going to split hairs, they might lean toward another position at 16 if they're going to stick and pick. Um, but so, but then my mind says, my mind says, if you're going to stick and pick at 16, if one of Fuaga or Barton or Fatanu are there and you want to move them to guard, even I'm not the biggest guy at taking a guard in the first in general, but I really think one of these guys, because they're tackles primarily, but they will be absolute monster all pro guards. You've leaned into in at least this kind of quasi like all in on the offense for 2024, looking at Gino's contract. I don't think he's going to be on the team this time next year at his current cap hit anyway. And then you signed Fant's not a four year deal, but a two year deal. So it's all very like all in. It, finish the job and get an elite guard, uh, like an elite guard, not just like a decent veteran, you know, that plays decently, you know, like go get an all pro. So one of those three, I think, is where is what my mind says. But my heart says Newton. Um, so that transitions right into the mock draft let's, simulator. Let's do this. I, I, we were, we're going to talk about this in a second. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share um, my screen here. We're going to get into a mock draft. So, Griff, we're... we're we're at this position here with, with the Seahawks at 16. And in this particular uh, mock, we've got most of the normal guys are gone um, at this point. Fatanu has been selected in this case. Fuaga has been selected. What's your take on Mr. Latu uh, as an edge player? He's, he's, he's a guy that some people have incredibly high. Some people have concerns about whether he's got NFL athleticism. What's, what's your take on him? Um, I like Latu a lot. I, th I think that I kind of have all four or really, so like Latu verse and Turner, I'm really not dogmatic about any one of them relative to each other. If we're thinking for a Seahawk fit, I think Latu's weight and length makes maybe the most sense if you're trying to take an edge in the first, I mean, they have depth at edge. So I, I mean, like Latu doesn't have elite athleticism, but he's still above average. I think, like his 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 what did he run? Like a four six four seven, and whatever his weight is, like that's decent. That's still good. It's just not Dallas Turner good or Verse good, right? Um, I do think he's a really good run defender. He he's my favorite watch in terms of technique and stuff. In a perfect world, if we're gonna take an edge, I'd rather they trade back into the low twenties, pick up another second round pick, and then take an edge there. Um, but of, of the four main edges, Latu, Verse, um, uh, Chop, and um, and Turner, I would probably lean Latu, I think. Interesting. You prefer Latu over Verse. Yeah. Last year, I might have said Verse, though. That's set. Um, uh, well, you and I see that one pretty differently. That, that's, that's impressive. That's interesting to me. Is that – so I think Verse is – from an athlete perspective, definitely measures out uh, higher than Latu, uh, unless mm -hmm. someone's got information to, to the contrary. I see Verse as someone who's got power that I don't see from Latu. Latu seems like more of a technician. So, like, I, I see how he gets, how he's effective, and, and some of those things should translate. <clears throat> Excuse me, but I always worry about guys who are too much of technicians in college and then aren't necessarily the elite athletes and maybe those those moves and counter moves don't quite don't quite translate whereas power and speed and speed to power mm -hmm. you know that 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 can actually be unleashed even more in in uh, the nfl so that that's an interesting one for me i i this is why i like bringing on people that don't yeah. see see prospects the same way that we well, I, I i agree with your descriptions of each of them as players so like when i said like i wasn't dogmatic about any like i'm really struggling with the edges because i'm trying to think what the tiebreaker goes to because i see like a not a fatal flaw but a flaw in each one of them like latu is exactly what you said like he's not playing with a lot of power he's a lot of strength finesse he's not like power finesse it's mm -hmm. like by strength i mean like when he gets into his rip he can hold his ground but he's not bull rushing guys like verse can go speed the power 
The one fly I see with the verse is that even though he can win the edge, win the corner, he's a little stiff rounding it, so he kind of gives up a yard or two when he's bending it. Whereas with Turner, Turner has all the bend in the world. He just doesn't have the play strength of those two guys. Like, he's a little light, and that's – I don't know if 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 McDonald's looking for that. He'd rather bring that type of archetype of player off the bench. Is he ever going to be a full-time player in Seattle or a 70% 70 snap, 70 snap player in Seattle? I don't know. And then Chop is kind of like the same discussion there. So it's really – I guess I'm kind of viewing it as floor. Like, what's the highest floor of the two? Um, but, like, I like Verse a lot. I truly do. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm kind of being a coward. Like, I can't pick a side with – I like it. I like it. Yeah, I mean, well, one guy – yeah. One guy you can watch me edit HTML in real time here. So, well, one guy you see very differently, I know, is Derek Hall. The two of you. Do you see Derek Hall like taking a big jump, or like would they be? Will they have too many edges if they draft a first round edge, or do you see Hall kind of? How do you compare Hall to these four guys? So, I watched Hall in the 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 draft uh, process last year. I watched three games and I hated him. I was like, this guy's a fourth round pick, whatever. And then the testing came out, and I thought, okay, whatever. If you if you if you're reaching, then they go and take him at 36. And I'm like, oh no. And then I went back and watched all of his games because I always go back and watch every single game of guys that they draft, at least in the top three, four rounds. And I just happened to have picked like his three worst games from college, the games that I watched. I saw a lot more, um, not in terms of technique, but I really think that Hall has every single physical trait that you we want an edge i think he plays above his weight i think he has really good bend and agility for his composition um i think that he has speed to power and stuff i just think as a rookie he was just a mess but i like traits wise i like his traits more than boy mafe's and boy mafe in my opinion was horrible his rookie year and took a huge leap his second year and he also did that two years older than hall so i'm not banking on hall turning into boy mafe in his second year i just think that he has more going for him at age 22 than Mafe did. And I think that Hall can, can take a leap. Um, so, well, let, let's, let's take one more beat on that just to make sure, you know, just set that up as, as we have different opinions. And I think that's probably true, but here's my take on Hall. What I've always had issues with about Hall is I don't see, I don't see the bend in his game. I think he is a stiffer, athlete and i think he is much more of a he's got to beat you with power and i do think he's a hustle guy i think he's a good athlete but i don't see the bend in him around the edge and so he for me he reminded me a little bit of bruce Irvin was kind of what i got from Derek hall like hmm. bruce hall uh, bruce Irvin is obviously an amazing athlete and probably a little bit more bendy but but a lot of his pass rush was very vanilla. Bruce Irvin was just like, I'm going to try to speed around the edge and hopefully that does it. And with Derek Hall, I think he's got potential to, to do something. I think Mafe for me feels like a more flexible athlete in terms of how he shows up in, in games. And so that's where I liked him a little bit better. But he took a big leap. There's no doubt about it. Hall, I, I saw a couple of very, very minor flashes in the run game of him being, he's like, he's a willing, he's willing to get into the mix, stick his nose in there and, mm -hmm. and uh, make a play where Daryl Taylor still feels like either unwilling or unable um, to really fight in the, in the middle of the pile and, and really set an edge. So, I I would not bank on Derek Hall being great. I would not consider him this guy that you can't draft because he's a he's a lock um, to be your next, you know, high highly utilized rotational guy. But I don't think he's a. I would not be shocked if he puts up five sacks next year. Like that wouldn't shock mm -hmm. me um, as a reasonable progression. Yeah, well, that's where I just struggle with the edge in the first round. There's just so many bodies there. Like. I don't know. We'll get into this mock. Yeah. We'll see. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I agree. So I, I think this is the part of the reason we're we're spending time. We're, we're going to take our time on these mocks because it's going to be a way of us having this conversation, uh, getting into some of your 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 um, prospect rankings, Griff. Jared Verse is a guy that 
the reason we talked about him a little bit, Jeff and I are very high on him. And for me, he might be one of those guys where you have to stick and pick. I think he's, he's potentially an elite edge. Uh, it sounds like you feel like you'd rather, if you're going to do edge, maybe do it a little bit later. If you're here, if this, if this is the situation, Griff, mm-hmm. Otan is gone. Fuag is gone. Your guy, Johnny Newton's here. Byron Murphy's here. By the way, they have him ranked similarly to you and that you've got Johnny Newton as your top D tackle. I think I, I've got this open here. I think you've got Byron Murphy as your second, right? So it's not mm-hmm. like you don't like Byron Murphy, but you just have Newton first. Right. Are you trying to stick and pick here? Are you trading back? What are you doing? At 60, oh man, I don't know. I really feel like, I really feel like they need to get an extra day two pick. Um, I, I really think they need to pick in the first, second, third, fourth, bang, bang, bang. Yep. It's really tough though. If they decide to choose and just take one of their favorite, what they see as a potential blue chip kind of guy at 16, I'm not going to fault them for it. Like I, I get it. Um, if forced to pick, I, I think I go Newton here, even though like, I feel like D line is the strength of the def- defensive roster. It's still, there's, there's room for like one more 600, 700 snap player. And then also, you know, you're looking at potential exits from Jaron Reed next year, maybe Draymond Jones. So you're kind of getting ahead of that. Kill two birds with one stone. Um, I think that I would go Newton. I would also go Murphy. I think, though, that if I had to choose, I would try to trade back into the 20s and see who would. That's You're playing with fire, though, because then you're, you're missing out on the potential impact player. Um, Let's go ahead and, and take a look at the trade offers that are there. Uh I do want to get into this Newton versus Murphy conversation because I'm really curious. So here's here's a very good offer. My, the Dolphins are offering the 21st pick, so move back five spots. They then are offering the 55th pick in the second round in exchange for your 118th pick. So you're moving up, moving back five spots in the first round. You're moving back, or you're moving up, uh, you know, 60 odd spots in you know from a fourth to a, a second round pick. That seems like a good deal. Yeah, agreed. Uh, let's just see what else we got. We got 26 and 57, 20 and 51. Ooh. That seems like a pretty clean deal. Yeah. Which yeah, do you want, Griff? You, 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 you're, uh... well, I think we got to go Pittsburgh, right? Jeff, you although, agree? Although, although Tampa Bay offering a first for next year is pretty yeah. interesting. <laughs> it's a yeah. bit of the flaw in the sim. In the sim. Uh, <laughs> really I think I'm yeah, Pittsburgh, though. These feel pretty uh, optimistic, although I do think there are going to be there are going to be teams that are going to value Jared Verse, Johnny Newton, Byron Murphy, maybe one of these tackles, maybe lots. Yeah, of, I think like uh, Latham or uh, Mims could be a guy too. That, that they might be like these might be realistic offers. I don't know, uh, but if you can get a second round pick and just move back five spots, <laughs> four <laughs> spots, I think you got to do it. So we're taking this Pittsburgh deal. Is that, is that what we agreed? I think so. Yeah. All right, GM, Mr. Griff. Let's let's do it. It's done. Brian Thomas Brian Jr. Thomas. is is who got. So basically, you got you got everyone left who you wanted. Wow. Wow. Do you trade that again? <laughs> <laughs> See, I think what I think ends up happening is I think Schneider trades back twice. I think that's what he ends up doing. I don't think he likes having a second, not having a second round pick. Um, but if, if I'm GM, I think I'm taking Newton here. Okay. Uh, before you do and explain why, uh, I want to welcome Andrew Scanlon as a new member on YouTube link is pinned in chat and you can access that right now. YouTube membership is just growing. If you're primarily consuming the content on YouTube, I highly recommend joining as a YouTube member puts a little emblem by your name. So we know when you make a comment in chat or in the channel anywhere and we respond a little bit more you get priority replies to those and then we're also doing different levels so we'll have things like uh, members only live streams members only q q a amas we're also going to do those for patreon members so there'll be patreon.com uh, hog blogger where you can get uh, instant access to the slack channel all the audio versions of this show outside of the Wednesday where the real Hawk talk with the crew, everybody gets that all the time for the audio versions of every other pod, the Hawk blogger mornings, the emergency pods, the mock draft madness, all those 
you got to be a Patreon member, patreon.com slash Hawk blogger, sign up, get access there. And we'll start doing things like live shows for just Patreon members. So now's the time to join. Thank you, Andrew, for joining. And then click, click subscribe, click like. We are nearing the 10,000 mark for YouTube subscribers. Would love to get over 10K. Uh, so please join and subscribe there. All right. So, all right. You got to tell me, Johnny Newton, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to start with the salvo since we've been having you talk so much. And Jeff, I want to go to you before we go to Griff on this, because I want to hear your thoughts on Newton versus Murphy. In fact, let's start with you, Jeff. I don't know if I really know what is your perspective on Newton versus Murphy. It's pretty close. I've I've been a Murphy guy. I just think he's a little more talented from just like a disruption pass perspective. I know a lot of the film guys. Like I saw John Ledyard and some of the, the more like draft national film guys. Ledyard, uh, Trevor Sikma from PFF, and I think it was Connor Rogers who did the PFF podcast. They all have Newton number one. And Griff, who comes up a lot of film, and I know Griff's been on Newton for a while. So it's pretty close. I, I like Murphy. I just see him as a little more disruptive, a little more of an athlete. I think he's just a little better of a prospect. Um, Newton, I haven't dug into as much. I know he does flash a lot on tape. I know Witherspoon really, really likes him. I just have seen Murphy a lot more, and I feel more comfortable with him. I think he's just has a higher, more likely case to be a blue chip player. But I still need to dive into Newton a little bit more, and I'm curious to hear where Griff's perspective is on this one. But I know I need to dive a little more into that one. Yeah. So Griff, where I'm at on these two is, and I'm curious if this will be, this, this will be kind of a pattern for us. I, I, I look at the athlete and the body type. And I think I look at how those are going to project to NFL matchups more than I'm looking at whether these guys are technically sound doing their, their like doing what the coaches need them to do, playing the position the way it needs to be played. For me, Byron Murphy profiles as an elite NFL athlete. I think that he not, I think he's going to enter the NFL as a quick twitch, 300 plus pound, 300 plus pound athlete that can put on more weight if needed. I'm not saying he is Aaron Donald, but he is that kind of, 300 pound quick twitch guy that you just don't find very often. Mm -hmm. I find Johnny Newton. I, I see him as he's, if you just look at his numbers, they're similar um, weight. Johnny Newton, certainly a speed guy. I don't see the same level of power in Newton that I see in Murphy. And I worry that, that Newton's going to be a guy that is maybe like a Quentin Jefferson plus plus, like mm -hmm. really able to, to quickly get off the ball and if he gets to the spot before you do he's going to be fine but if an offensive lineman gets his hands on him he's going to struggle I, I don't i don't know if he's going to be as consistent of a guy that you can say i'm going to play him three downs and he's going to be a major disruptor mm -hmm. i think he has a little bit more of a hard ceiling in my opinion murphy i see a much higher potential ceiling for what he can be and so that's why I'm a little bit higher on Murphy. And I know you're, we're, we're, we're splitting hairs here. Like you're right. talking about your number one and your number two. For me, it's yeah. more like Newton is probably my number four. Um, you know, I probably have him below Tavondre Sweat and, and uh, Michael Hall Jr. And gotcha. so tell me a little bit what you see in Newton since this, this is your guy. Um. So yeah, athletically, like they're both very much like six one, three hundred. They kind of have short arms, and so I wonder, like, for as much as we're talking about these guys, I really wonder if McDonald is just internally like, no, they, I don't, I want a Matabuike type frame. I want the six three, three ten guy. I don't know. So this might all be moot. But uh, what I see is I both see them as kind of classic three techniques. Newton is a three technique that can play big end. So four, four, I five and the three, four stuff. And then Murphy is a three technique that can play a little bit of nose if you wanted to. Uh, Cause he did play a lot of two eye and one technique at Texas. And that kind of took him out of some of his pass rush opportunities. I thought um, mm -hmm. I agree that out of his stance, Murphy has more power, like out of his first step. Um, I do think though that Newton, I think Newton just has more of like a, toolkit as a pass rusher uh when For you sure. when you do when you do find murphy's reps over the guard 
He just doesn't have as much working for him. I don't think he's as good at just feeling out and finding the corner, the, the outside half of the guard as Newton is. Newton is kind of more routinely getting to the upfield shoulder on the outside half and kind of bending it toward him. I think he's a little bit more agile than Murphy. Um, so, but again, it's at the same time, like you said, you're talking floor and ceiling. It's like, well, Murphy was still really productive as a pass rusher on centers and stuff. And if he's, you know, seems a little underdeveloped, well, in time he could be, you know, if he develops, could he be even better than, than Newton? Um, so I totally see the thought process there. And like you said, we're splitting hairs. Like he is my number two, right? Like I like him a yeah. lot. Um, <laughs> yeah. it, it's just, I just have this sense with Newton that he's like, I think he is still really quick. I don't think he's lacking power. I think his speed to power is pretty good. Like when he rushes from like a wide three, like Michael Bennett would, like really wide, but he's still in the B gap. He can convert that to power and he can still send the guard for a right. And then his his counters off of it are just endless, just endless. Um, and then he also gets a lot of, he also gets a lot of like uh, production that doesn't rely on his traits. So like just gaming the protection plan, knowing what the blocking scheme is, just like, extra stuff like the cherry on top kind of production um and you know maybe like that's kind of what like you said like the tape guys are leaning on i don't know um i i also think as a run defender like murphy like i said he's a three technique that could play nose he's going to be a little more stout if he has a combo mm -hmm. that stays on him for a while i don't think newton is poor against that just not as good as murphy but on one-on-ones on a guard Newton will eat guys for lunch in the run game. I mean, he destroyed Penn State, just absolutely destroyed them. Um, whenever they ran to his side, and he's playing the front side, he's playing with perfect technique, um, and he's able to get off the block. He always gets off the block. I mean, he's doing karate half the time. Um, and the other thing is he put on 15 pounds, and I don't think it only helped him, and he didn't lose any quickness from his uh, 2022 season to the 2023 I was kind of worried about that because he was more like Draymond Jones sized yeah. last year. And I thought, well, if they're going to put on weight, like is, is he, cause some guys put on weight and it doesn't help them. He right. put on weight and it did help him. Like he didn't, he handled it really well. Um, so it really just kind of, I think it comes down to style preference for me, but again, I still really like Murphy. Um, but I really like Hall too. And so if the, if, the, if the theory is don't take a D tackle in round one, get whatever you have to do, trade back, and you want to get your a potential guy that really has impact, then go get Hall on day two, you know? I don't know. Yeah. Well, so let's make our pick here. I do want to say, so we've talked all about Newton and Murphy, and we talked about edges. We have not talked about interior line. And Graham Barton, they've got him lower here. They got him as a 31st ranked prospect. But Graham Barton's here, and Jackson Powers Johnson's here. Either of those guys tempting to you to take over a Newton or a Murphy? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to complain if they take Barton. I really like Barton. I think he'd be an elite guard. And I think the reason why people are talking about moving him to guard is, one, because he could do it. But also, he's a little shorter armed for tackles. And I think a lot of guys don't want to – I think they want 33, 34-inch arms for tackles, and I think he's sitting at 32. So I think that's why he's being talked about as a guard. Um but yeah, I mean, he would. I mean, he he probably makes the most difference in the team for this season of any one player. If you're just looking, I at agree. It. Uh, so the I've question here, that. yeah, the question here would be: Are you better off with Barden and Michael Hall, or the Noonan Murphy and then the Garden round two? Well, right. Where do you feel? That's that's the question we have to answer here. Exactly. Yeah. So and make I, the call, Mister Mister Griff. Are you going with one of your D tackles, or are you going for that guard? Let's go, Barton. Let's do Barton and see how the draft. I love goes. it. We had people show yesterday. Yeah, if people didn't listen to the show yesterday, I highly recommend it. And in fact, I unlocked it for everybody, even folks not on Patreon.com uh, slash Hawk Blogger. Uh, we had Eric McLean, who is, and yes, that's how it's pronounced, McLean. Uh, from the ACC Network, former Clemson offensive lineman. He went deep on Barton and a uh, big fan of his. And if you haven't looked at Brandon Thorne's timeline with some of his time with Barton recently, I recommend it. I he, he is screaming up the charts for me and certainly is a guy I've talked to Jeff. He may be, you could make the case he is a better fit for what the Seahawks 
for all the different things the Seahawks might need on the offensive line than Fatani. Doesn't mean he's a better player, but he gives you hedges at all five spots potentially, and he might be a plus player at all five spots. So um, very interesting player. I'm definitely much higher on him now than I was two days earlier. So now here we are at 51, guys. We've got we've got our interior offensive lineman. And now we get into second level. So Michael Hall Jr. is sitting here. Uh, yeah. Ruka Roa Ro is sitting here. You could go double up on, on guard and get Cooper Beebe. You've got Chris Braswell, who I think a lot of folks like as an edge. Cam Kitchens is safety. I don't know how you feel, Griff, about our safety situation. We've got one guy right. who's on a one-year deal and one guy who's uh, on a two-year deal. Um, Chris Jenkins is another guy available. Peyton Wilson, you could go linebacker. You could look at one of these guys. And I know you and I and Jeff are all big fans of Junior Colson. If you don't draft one of those guys here, they might not be here by the time you pick at 81. What are you prioritizing at this pick? This is a tough one. It is really tough. Um, Man, I don't see the thing is that they take a safety. They need a safety for the long-term picture. But if, if they take one, there's a strong chance he doesn't play very much this year as a rookie um just because they have so many guys there i don't know it's really hard i don't i don't want to be the team that passes up michael hall and then sees him turn into chris jones or something down the line um i think hall's good tape is as good as murphy and newton's Mm -hmm. and also the the good snaps are as frequent as well it's just that the bad snaps are worse and more and also more frequent um but like he's 20 though and i would also so argue young. his age 20 season is better than both newton and murphy's so i don't know i and, sounds and then, like you know yeah, yeah. Jeff, 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 give, give griff a break jeff what would you do here uh i think because griff passed on newton you have to. if you come out of this draft without hall or newton i think you're gonna feel pretty shitty at the end i think you could have gone potentially newton and for your guy, Newton, then maybe a BB. But the fact that you took Barton, I think you have to take Hall here. So this means you, you guys are both heading towards a direction where you're really risking the linebacker spot. You're risking coming out of this draft with a linebacker that doesn't project to be a starter, even down the line, potentially. You you good with that? Yeah. Well, let's live dangerously, I think. Let's, let's do it. We're Michael Hall, yeah, I, I'm with you. So we, the three, this consensus, all three of us. I would take Michael Hall Jr. here, and I wouldn't think twice about it. I mean, he is he is the I think the best player on this board. I think their rankings are off, and uh, so we now I think have just done what Jeff and I always like to do. We we've, we've solidified the the lines, both sides of the lines, and so I love that with the first two picks. We're now here at the 81st pick in this draft. We've taken Graham Barton. We've taken Michael Hall Jr. I love those first two picks. And now where do we go next? Junior Colson sitting there. It almost feels too obvious, right? Michigan. <laughs> I think he's the most well-rounded pure Mike prospect in the class. And he understands the system because it's similar enough. And, you know, he's 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 got length. He's not. 5'11, you know, he's he's pretty he's a good height for Mike. He's a good weight too. So many of these guys are coming out at 230 now instead of 240. And at 240, I mean, he didn't test. He might be like a 4'6 guy, but that's not slow. It's just not really fast. Uh, but his change of direction is good. I think he can like shrink and expand in tight spaces, which is all those little like subtle movements that a lot of linebackers just don't have. They're really stiff. If you want to find that, they're usually 230. So he can give you that at 240. And then I think just he's a he he's gotten better every single season. He's a little, he's a little raw, but I think everything projects toward him being like a complete linebacker, being able to play in coverage, can match routes, can identify like when it's play action and stuff. I would take him and be happy about it and just live with the results. If Colson doesn't work out, so be it. I think it's a good process pick here. What do you I guys think? Jeff, about? I assume you're on board with that. Yeah. I- I would be comfortable taking Colts in the end of the second round. To get him the third to me with those two guys, it's a no brainer. I will tell you, I, I, for folks who've been listening to the Hawk Blogger, Hawk Blogger Mornings, probably been hearing my evolution on this. 
I no longer think Junior Colson is a second round pick. I think he's actually a third round pick. I, I, based on way, the way things are moving with receiver, with defensive tackle, with some other positions. And honestly, looking at Colson, I as much as I love Colson, he is not necessarily the elite athlete that you want to see at linebacker. I think he's got some limitations there. I'm super high on him. I think he's going to be, it would be a great Seahawk, but I think he's going to be there in the third round is, is basically my point. And if I you really don't get, if you don't get him, I don't think it's, I don't think it's quite the end of the world, but um, the fact that he's here, let's, let's add him to the mix. I think that's a, a great addition. We've now added, I'm, I'm not looking at drafts after the first round it takes too much time and who cares so so now you've got graham barton you've got michael hall jr and you've got junior colson i think you could walk away from the draft happy at this point <laughs> but we're yeah. gonna keep going um where do you go next uh any of these guys that that you call that call out to you as just great prospects that maybe you see differently than other other people griff um Jalen ford was a guy he was like my colson contingency plan in the fourth or fifth round but they've they've got They've got, you know, Colson now, and they I, I like Baker as a free agency signing, so you're probably good at linebacker. Um, my mind, I would go safety at this point, and the safety that I think of the guys available that I like the most, James Williams is really intriguing, but I think the guy I would go is Mustafa. Um, so, oh. Yeah, just he's, he's a little bit of everything, kind of a jack-of-all-trades, and... I think that's what McDonald wants out of – he wants his safeties to be interchangeable to a degree. Um, the The only thing I think about, though, is that, like, they signed Marcus Williams to a $70 million, de $7 million deal. He's 6'1". They drafted Kyle Hamilton. He's 6'4". Um, you look at Rayshon Jenkins, Julian Love. They're all they're all six foot, six one. you know. So I don't know if he's thinking – if in his mind he's even thinking about – a 510 safety. I don't know, but like Mustafa plays big. He plays big. He can close space. He's really comfortable. So I would take Mustafa. Um I, I love know. it. And I know Jeff 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 uh has has turned me on to him. Nice. He's a hitter, man. Uh, they need a hitter back there. And yeah. and I think it's worth, you know, again, Eric McLean on the show yesterday he unprompted called out Malik Mustafa as a guy that he just loves. And in fact, Malik Mustafa's mom uh, reacted to our tweet and our, our, our uh, show yesterday about, about her son. So nice. uh, definitely a guy of interest and <clears throat> uh, adding him here. I will just say there's a couple other guys that I think are worth thinking about here. Doubling up a guard <clears throat> is not a bad idea in my opinion. I, I I'm not necessarily totally bought in on Anthony Bradford being the answer. And then I think you could potentially look wide receiver. Mason McCormick is another guard. I think that's interesting here, but I'm super, super on board with you have another fourth round pick and you got another fourth round pick and here you are. So it's now are you, are, you start, are you starting to think receiver? Are you starting to think you double up a D tackle, double up D tackle guard, <laughs> Uh, tight end Theo Johnson being here, wide you know wide receivers. We said any of these players, Griff, that are high on your list. Is yeah, <laughs> it's interesting. Um, I've heard a lot about Oladapu, but I haven't been able to watch him. Oladapu. Um, let's see who, who who's there at receiver. Who all is there at receiver? Right, I like the idea. Receiver at trying to find like a sneaky good receiver pick to get ahead of Lockett's exit eventually. Yeah. I was hoping Javon Baker would be there still. Oh, wow. He went right before us. <laughs> yes, he did. Oh, man. Tell us about Javon Baker. What do you like about Javon Baker? Um, he, he's a little he's a little raw, but he's kind of a guy that is a little bit of, of like a do-it-all Z receiver. I mean, he can run the horizontally breaking routes. He can play the ball too in, in, in the air and like kind of flat trajectory throws in traffic. Um, I mean, he can get off the line of scrimmage. He, it's it's kind of like a scheme proof guy. And because of that, that means you can fit him around the skill sets you have between DK and JSN. So if we're thinking about like when Lockett is gone, um, you know, I mean, I feel like Baker could be one of those mid round receivers that ends up 
that puts up productive seasons in the NFL. There's always a guy every year that gets taken in the third or fourth round that does pan out. I just feel like he could be one of them. But I haven't looked into enough of the other receivers to really say. Um, do you guys have any opinions on them? I mean, I'm I'm always concerned about any McCaffrey DNA going in the league. And the fact that he's projected a fifth, sixth round pick in most places, I'm like, what McCaffrey's come into the league and not been a good player. So I, I, I haven't watched him enough, but I watch him at the combine. He's, he he moves reasonably well. So that, that's just a, I'm not saying I'd take him here, but he, I definitely am interested in him. Brendan Rice, I think to me could be, end up being a third round level player as a receiver. And I love the idea what I'd really love is to find a way to get Rice and McCaffrey so that 49ers fans are really frustrated. Um, Fair. Uh, and we have the corner of the market on Seahawks legends named Rice that play receiver. Indeed. Uh, I honestly, what I would probably do here, I would double up on guard. I would get Mason McCormick. I, I, oh, I like over Mason Zinter. McCormick. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I might go Zinter. Like, I don't know. It's hard with Zinter because I don't have the medicals. So if his medicals are clean, I just don't know about that. But I like McCormick as a developmental player. I think he's a decent athlete at that position. And you, if you've already got a guy you know is going to play, he can develop as opposed to being the guy that you need to depend on year one. Um, Zinter feels like a guy that if he's healthy, he could step right in and and be a good player. So I would probably go that direction. I also like Theo Johnson quite a bit, but I really feel like tight ends a, a position I would just rather them draft in the sixth, seventh round. Whoever's left, uh, you know, take a chance there. See, I was going to say I think tight end might be a sweet spot here because some of the guys we look at in our mocks, like the Tip Ryman and whatever, I think he's going to be a fourth round pick. Eric All, yeah, like AJ Barner, more of the blocking guys. If you're just looking at those guys, yeah, you can wait six round, but. Do you want like the Theo Johnson or the Tip Ryman? You might have to take them here. It might be the sweet spot for it. Where they, they I think that's probably for Kittle that one draft and they they miss the whole group. That's that's a fair but, point. All right, so Griff, you get final say here. Where where are you going? I think I'll go guard uh, McCormick then probably. All right. How do you how do you how do you feel about McCormick? Um, so I'll be honest, he's one of the guards that I've not watched. Okay. Um, when, I'm when eager he... to hear your thoughts when you get a chance to watch his tape. Uh, okay. A lot of the coaches love this guy. So okay. my guess is you might as well. Interesting. Interesting. All right. Round five, pick 192. We've doubled up on guard. We've got a defensive tackle. We've got a linebacker. Christian Boyd's here. I'm not saying we're going to take another defensive tackle how do you feel about christian boyd i like him as a mid late round guy he's got a lot of potential um i believe he's fairly productive i think he fits them as well stylistically baltimore loves taking day three defensive linemen and i think they one of the highest hit rates so whatever it whatever is in the water whatever they're looking for it seems to work and he definitely feel i mean boyd feels like a ravens pick so by virtue of that, he feels like a Seahawks pick. Uh, 174, if that's like where he's being projected. So 179, I mean, I would take that and not hesitate and just let it play out. The other thing I would think is maybe uh, Luaf or L L Lufeo from Notre Dame. Yeah, I was just going to um, ask you about him. I, I, I think he's a really solid linebacker. He's just a little slow. But he can close space. He's smart. He knows what he's doing out there, and like that counts for a lot. Like you can you can make up for being slow in the in the NFL linebacker if you know what you're really doing. I mean, look at KJ Wright. The guy was running a four eight in 2019, and I think 2019 was the best season of his career. So mm -hmm. like, I mean, I could that would be really good insurance. Maybe if Baker balls out and they can't afford him, looking at 2025 cap. You know, like they may not be able to afford him if they have to prioritize someone else. I know they'll make cap moves, but he could be good insurance too. So Boyd or, or uh, Marist is who I would take here. Um, Boyd, I think Boyd has a 30 visit with Seattle lined up, if I'm correct on that. Okay. I believe that's true. I believe that's true. And it's it's, it's just really interesting you brought up Marist because when I went deep dive on linebackers, I hadn't I honestly hadn't heard about him as much, and, and I was getting into his – 
what some of the different analysts have for him and then looking at his numbers. He's slow, but apparently he's a decent coverage backer, like decent in, in like carrying some routes. And I, I haven't watched the film, but it seems surprising because he's not a fast dude. So he, agreed. So many of the linebackers in this class, it's so frustrating. And I, it sounds like I'm being so callous, but like so few of them like know what they're doing in coverage just from, or, or the way that they're schemed. Like Jeremiah Trotter has a lot of hype and, and I'm not calling anyone. I don't know like what the Seahawks Twitter sphere thinks of him. I just know that like nationally he's spoken of as almost like a fringe first rounder. And it's even if he can do all this stuff, like Clemson doesn't ask him to. Like, how can you even evaluate? Like, they don't even ask him to do anything. Like, he spies, he blitzes. Like, all right. Notre Dame actually asks their linebackers to do linebacker things. And Maris can, like, he clearly knows, like, he knows how to put the picture together. He knows what the offense is doing to him to inform him. How do I tailor my spot drop? Where, where are the dangerous spots and everything? He's really comfortable in the box. Like, closing space, tight, tight corners. I mean... If a 300 pound guard is squares up with him and he's on his heels, he's only two. There's only so much a linebacker can do. Like, even like Bobby Wagner has reps where, you know, Mike Ayupati when he's on the 49ers, it's just it's football, right? But then there's other examples like where if, if he's reading the playout, right, like he can handle himself in the box. So, um, he's he's like to me, Maris is like competence at linebacker. He may not raise your ceiling, but he's competent and. You know, that's there's a lot of value there. So I don't know. Let, let, let's let's go Marist here. Let, let, let's take him. All right. Done. I, I, it's interesting. It, it It's nice with a later round pick here to raise the floor um, at that linebacker spot where you've got some questions. Um, now we are at uh, second six round pick at 192. Are we looking tight end safety? Any of these names that jump out at you from any position group? I don't, I, I'm curious what you guys think of, about McLaughlin, the tight end, just because at this point, like draft athletes, oh, Vaki, ooh, the safety Vaki. So when I watched, I think he's Utah, right? When yes. I was watching their other safety that they have, I'm blinking on his name. Cole Bishop. Cole yeah, Bishop, Cole yeah. Bishop. So Vaki stood out more to me. I think Vaki is, his change of direction, like on the fly is really impressive and he plays above his weight. I think he's pretty smart. He'll miss tackles sometimes coming down from a deep distance. But then I wonder, like, some of the some of those tackling opportunities are so, like, stacked against him. When you're coming from 20 yards out trying to make a play in the flat, the running back or the receiver is a two-way go. A lot of safeties miss those tackles. I just feel like he's a football player. And I don't know. If they want to, if they want to take another safety, um, I mean, I think it makes sense to double up at the position. I think he's a good density too. Like he's not super small. Um, I might take Vaki, honestly. All right. Interesting. Uh, some folks are saying he's going to be a running back. Uh, I heard about that. In the league. So we'll, I, yeah. we'll see there. It's good to hear your thoughts. I will take him in a second. I do want to recognize Slackers are us just became a YouTube member. Thank you for joining. Great time to join. And the link is pinned in chat. So uh, thank you for joining as YouTube member. Slackers are us. Sioni Vaki, you are a Seahawk. One more pick for you, Griff. And then we're going to wrap up with a couple quick questions and let you get on with your weekend. Not take to, taking a tight end. Um, <laughs> remarkably, you've got Tip Ryman there. I do not think he's going to last until this late. But uh, are you going tight end here? There's no, is there another position that you're looking at? You want Mr. Mr. Beautiful Sam Hartman as a quarterback developmental prospect? Yeah, another non uh, Schneider quarterback draft. <laughs> Gabriel Murphy. Yeah. Ooh, wow! I don't Dylan think Dylan Johnson. John. So one name that I saw actually, Baltimore has a similar rostering strategy as the Seahawks do at corner. They did take Marlon Humphrey in the first, but that was like what 2017. Mm -hmm. They they roster most of their corners on day three. Um, I saw Ryan Watts there. He's very intriguing. Even though he's listed at safety, he's played corner for them. Um, he could be he could be interesting. Um, he definitely Is that the guy you want? Out. Yeah, let's take Watts. See what happens. I think they view him as a corner. Um, 
but that could be all right here is the 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 griffin sturgeon hawkbogger morning draft how are you feeling about it griff you walk I, away I, and the seahawks have done this how are you feeling I'm feeling pretty good. You've you've got you, you really you finally addressed the O line in spite of what Schneider said about guard being <laughs> uh -huh. overdrafted and overpaid. Um, man, the guards, the league's guards agents probably didn't feel good about hearing that. But I, I like I like Graham Barton. I think you've improved the team the most with this pick of all the available picks. Michael Hall is something that you you swing your sword on if it doesn't work. That's fine because of what could have been. This is like you rarely get these opportunities. Junior Colson, I think, is, is a, a strong pick, especially at 81. And then I want to see what uh, what McDonald can do with someone like Malik Mustafa and Vaki. I mean, I think he could turn them into contributors. Um, so it's I, I, I think that you've got good ceiling and good floor here and, and some projects that could that the coaching staff can get their hands on mold. So. Jeff, how about you? What what's what's your grade on this draft? I go with a, a B plus. It's a really good draft. I guess I don't know if we have like the upside, but Michael Hall, a lot of it. Michael Hall can bring this draft to me. So I really like the positions you've hit on. If you come out with those first four rounds, I'd be so fired up. I don't know if Schneider's ever had a draft where I think until they took JSN last year, I don't think I've ever identified like a pick that they were going to take and actually got it right as a player I liked. So the first four guys are all guys I really like. Um, I like Zinter a little more than McCormick, but again, Zinter's medical could be a disaster. It, it was a really, to me, like the Barden Hall thing. And then I, I like exactly what you said about Hall. And what's good about this draft is that Colson really neutralizes that risk because even if Hall isn't the upside that he can be, I think Colson, you kind of know, he's very projectable. And he can be like, if you took him at 51, I don't think anyone would be like, that's crazy. So I, I'd be really happy with this draft. The first four, especially. Uh, I'm, I'm really, really confident. If you come out with those four guys, that draft looks really good to me. And Schneider always does things a little differently than I would. So I'm hoping Griff, Griff picks are where we go with this thing. I, I, give, I give you an A. Solid A on this, Griff. I, I, think, I think Graham Barton may be one of the surest bets to be a pro bowl plus level guard in, in this draft. And I think to your point, I think that really lifts the overall team. I think Michael Hall jr. Could end up being the best defensive tackle in this draft. Like, I think he's got the potential to do that and you're getting him in the second round. Junior Colson could be your starting linebacker for the next five years, you know, like mm -hmm. whatever he ends up being. Uh, Mustafa is a guy that's a, you know, to Jeff's point, a, a tone setter at safety, which you love that. And then you double up at, at guard. Marist, uh, Lufau at linebacker it gives you a floor, a higher floor at linebacker and doubles up there where I think all of a sudden now linebacker starts to be almost a strength on this roster. And then you got, uh, a, you know, got you double up at safety with, with Vaki. I don't know Vaki's game as well. Um, so interesting there. And Watts, you mentioned another guy I have not had familiarity with. So I think this is a, a terrific draft. And before, so congratulations on dramatically improving the quality of this Seahawks team. We've gone at this for over an hour and a half, so I don't want to keep you too much longer, but is there any other player Griff that we have not talked about that you're in love with in this draft? It could be a later guy. It could be an earlier guy. Yeah. There's someone who you're just feeling like, man, I just want the Seahawks to call his name uh, this year. Um, I'm trying to think. Okay. So if the, if they can't get forward. Yeah, there, there is actually, I just realized. So Michael Barrett, Colson's partner in crime mm. at Michigan. I think that it's it's a little bittersweet because I think he's a will, and they're talking about Baker at will. Baker could play Mike if they wanted to, but it sounds like they really want him at will, which I think is an encouraging sign because it means like the if they identify Will as a Robin in the scheme and the Mike as the Batman, that means that they're shooting for the stars at Mike and whoever they take at Mike to this guy's going to be our middle linebacker. They really like him. We saw that they traded for Roquan Smith, right? There's commentary there. Um, but Michael Barrett, I think is, he, he is, 
if you're just if you're not gauging value and you're not gauging like impact or whatever, but if you're just like you're getting like nitty gritty with it, I think he was the best college linebacker last year and all hmm. of the guys that I watched just in terms of like controlling what he can control. I mean, he plays like a 10 year vet and I have a comp for him. It's it's like north of 30, but before he like turned 35, it's Thomas Davis um, in wow. Carolina. I think Michael Barrett's going to be a really good pro. Um, it's just, unfortunately, like, I don't know how he fits around Baker if they have really clear plans for, for, for Baker, but I mean, he just knows what he's doing. And, and, and at two thirty, he's extremely good at contact. I mean, I've posted some clips he's tossing, I don't know how, but he's tossing 300 pound guards to the floor and he even looks better than Colson on contact. And I don't think Colson's deficient whatsoever against contact, but his zone drops are like, I mean, he, he, he plays linebacker like he's playing quarterback. Like he, he's reverse engineering the entire picture. Like he's thinking for the quarterback. Some stuff that reminds me of, of um, KJ Wright at his peak. Um, but in terms of like overall style, I mean, I, I just keep seeing Thomas Davis in, in all phases, run in, pass, and blitz. So um, again, Michigan man, right? He's got the background with, with McDonald's. So I really like him. What a what a great comment and and player to call out. And when you call out Thomas Davis, it's a good one because that's not the guy that everyone thinks about. But anyone that's watched enough football knows that guy was a just monster at linebacker, huge difference maker uh, for Carolina. And as much as Keekley got all the attention, Thomas Davis was right there as a nightmare uh, duo with with Keekley all those years. Griff, thank you so much for coming on and spending your Saturday morning with us. Where can folks find you and your podcast and your content if they want to follow you and, and hear more? Yeah, my uh, my Twitter handle is C Mike Spin Move. Um, I talk about football and other things, trying to keep it more football focused, though. Um, I, I like to answer questions, so if, if you've got questions, you know, I, I like to engage and stuff. Um, and just generally chat and hear what you guys have to think too. I also do a podcast with Maddie Brown and Ty Dan Gonzalez called Seattle Overload. Um, right now we're, we're doing a tape series where we're kind of watching tape live for like the first, some of it's our first exposure to a player. So we haven't really prepped on the guy. So we're kind of giving you our, our raw and unfiltered uh, uh, look. So like we watched Newton last week, we're going to try to watch Murphy tomorrow night. And like I said, like I have Newton above Murphy, but I might, change my mind watching it live with Maddie and talking it over with him, you know? So um, you never know what could happen. Uh, and we're just generally talking about the draft and and we're, we're also going to try to get into um, more scheme on McDonald's. So yeah, we, we, we just, we're just talking ball over there. It's a great, great pod. If you haven't checked it out, I highly recommend it. Uh, definitely Griff. One of the things I really respect about Griff is he is out front with his points of view, does not shrink away from it. And he's also just a good dude when he's disagreeing with somebody. And so people come at him and have, you know, they're jerks about it. And he's kind in response, which takes, I mean, I respect anybody who can manage to maintain that kind of persona, especially online when it's not in person. So, uh, you know, always, always appreciate it. Even when you and I have seen Cody Barton and Jordan Brooks a little bit differently. I still have tons of respect for you. And so I really appreciate you coming on. Jeff, I'm going to see you tomorrow afternoon as you and I and Rob Staten uh, do some draft talk. And Rob's certainly going to have tons of thoughts about what's going on with all these different prospects. I wouldn't be surprised if he has wildly different takes on some of these players. And I also don't always agree with Rob. So we'll see how that all goes, man. Me <laughs> so Jeff, that's real Jeff Simmons. He will be back tomorrow. And uh, Griffin Sturgeon at C Mike Spin Move. This is Brian Nemhauser. This has been another episode of Hawk Blogger Mornings. We will see you tomorrow at 5 p.m. Until then, please give the show a like. Click subscribe on the channel and join as a YouTube member or and over at patreon.com slash hawkblogger. We will see you soon. Have a great weekend.